Hi, this is our uh, third video lecture where we continue exploring the three promises of federalism and decentralization. The first two video lectures had introduced the twin concepts bringing in non majoritarian recognition and protection to regional and local levels of government in the issue areas under their responsibility. It should be clear by now that the terms we use, the meanings we attribute to them, and the official designation of political systems, say a federal republic or a decentralized unitary state, is inseparable from what we study. Furthermore, the terms themselves can become controversial and divisive. This is why, despite a heavy dose of federalism in their politics, countries like South Africa and Spain officially refrain from calling themselves federations. In fact, in some countries, federalism could carry with it negative connotations, suggesting separatism and dismemberment. Here, federalism is seen as a principle advocating radical decentralization, perhaps even the beginning of the breakup of a country. This is generally the case in countries whose history contains the trauma of deep internal divisions, or in unitary countries with a strong degree of centralization where any loosening of political power at the center engenders uh, fears of political dissolution. And in yet other countries, federalism can carry with it centralist connotations, favoring more nationwide politics and more central government involvement. This tends to be the case in established older federations, where the word federal has come to denote a shorthand for the federal government, hence the center. The United States and Canada are such examples. After all, the very Federalist papers of the late 18th century were written with the purpose of advocating a stronger role for the federal government in the United States. So, as we proceed into our third video lecture, please remember that the workings of federalism and the public perception of it could be somewhat different in different countries. This means that not every national experience from one country neatly and automatically translates into lessons for others. This caveat is uh, directed at those of you from different federal countries. Please wait for a few more modules before assuming that the way federal politics works in your country holds for each and every country where federalism and decentralization exist. A number of diverse factors play a role in influencing federalism's track record, and that is precisely what we want to examine in this course. You will see that sometimes the terms federalism and federation are used interchangeably. While this could be the practice in some countries, and indeed academic disciplines, conceptually the two represent different things. Federalism is a non-majoritarian political principle that favours territorially divided political authority, where regions and the centre both share power and have autonomy in the areas under their control. This principle could be accepted and implemented in varying degrees. When the state architecture fully implements the principles of federalism, we get a federation. A federation is the constitutional embodiment of federalism. It is a formal designation of a type of political architecture enshrined in a country's constitution. We could have a unitary state whose political foundations rest on the principle of one nation, one state, one legal system. We could also have a federation whose political foundations rest on federalism, that is, the division of powers between the center and the regional states. Now, the tricky thing is we could have federalism, but this might stop short of a full-fledged formal title of being a federation. For example, the Spanish state is formally not a federation, but it also has fairly strong constituent regional states called autonomous communities, which have autonomy over a number of issue areas where they have the final say, other areas that fall under the autonomy of the central state, and yet other areas where the regional states and the center work together. So there is indeed federalism in Spain for sure, but the country is not designated a federation. This is closely related to the caveat about terminology that we started our video lecture with. Because federalism carried with it negative connotations about breakup and separatism for many Spaniards, the country's new political architecture, following the death of its authoritarian ruler, General Franco, formally avoided the constitutional label federation. 
Yet the new Spain made up of autonomous communities was certainly influenced by the political principle of federalism, both in design and in practice. This certainly holds for Africa as well, particularly where deep political divisions exist. The terminology could play an important role in either exacerbating the divisions or helping provide a path to accommodation. The very term federalism itself is a loaded one in some parts of Africa. In some countries, it represents the country's very own self-image, as it is the case with Nigeria. But in other cases, say, like in South Africa, the term federal could carry connotations of past political episodes and therefore become a liability. Despite strong federal characteristics, South African constitution avoids the formal label federation for the political system it introduces. In Model 4, we will go into the details of South Africa and Nigeria and Ethiopia, but at this point suffice to say that do not take the formal constitutional designation of a country to be the final verdict on its politics. As Shakespeare wrote, that which we call rose would smell as sweet under any other name. Now, I'm not sure whether federalism is indeed a rose or whether or not it smells sweet, but certainly its flowers and its thorns feed from the same roots. So far, we have called decentralization federalism's less flashy sibling. It devolves some responsibility to the lower levels of administration, but without the full-fledged regional autonomy we see in federalism. At this point, it is important to note that the scholarly literatures on public administration and development economics view territorial decentralization as but one facet of the broader concept of decentralization. There are other ways to decentralize political power. Under deconcentration, the powers at the center could be shared between branches of state bureaucracy. Under delegation, powers of the center could be temporarily transferred to semi-public bodies or third parties. For our purposes in this course, and indeed in the academic field of comparative federalism, decentralization denotes the territorial devolution of political power to regional and local levels of government. And this power involves administrative, financial, legislative responsibilities, rather than the limited and partial transfer common in deconcentration and uh, delegation. So in this course, it should be clear that our interest is only on the territorial form of decentralization. In our first video lecture, we had talked about how the end of the Cold War brought an end to the proxy wars in Africa fought by pro-Soviet and pro-Western groups, and how liberal democratic ideas, if not practices, emerged triumphant in the early 1990s. The liberal consensus meant that the entire continent was now open to various international organizations, particularly Western aid and donor agencies. Foreign aid was often conditional on structural reforms and decentralization in its various guises, including territorial devolution, deconcentration and delegation, was a key component of these reforms. Decentralization was particularly prominent in the agendas of international organizations like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, who encouraged, supported and often even financed political and economic reforms in sub-Saharan Africa. Many international donors to this day continue to support such reforms. Particularly in the field of uh, development economics, decentralist policies are increasingly prescribed as the cure. We will revisit this theme and its relevance to the politics of development in our final module. Federal and decentralist reforms have been the defining characteristic of almost every democratic reform initiative in the last 20 years in Africa. The reforms have received strong international involvement and support. Most importantly, in all cases, decentralization was presented as a way to bring in better democracy, better public policy formulation and delivery, economic development and growth. In due course, the political landscape of the entire continent has changed. But have both federalism and decentralization lived up to their promises? Well, when we fast forward 20 years, the track record of federalism in Africa tends to be somewhat mixed. 
In the coming modules, we will see that not all promises of federalism and decentralization have been met. There are thus diverse lessons, both positive and negative, which necessitate a comprehensive and systematic treatment of the track record of federalism and decentralization. In comparative federalism, we are still at the stage of analysis. One should not prescribe any medicine before a proper diagnosis is made. This is not a course driven by a desire to recommend federalism as a cure to all ills. This is a course that seeks to analyze the workings of federalism and decentralization, both with pluses and minuses. Our goals are analytical rather than prescriptive. And now that this important caveat is made, I think we can conclude this video lecture. I'll see you in the next video overview of Module 1, where we will revisit some of these themes in order to reflect on some of the inherent normative and ethical questions around federalism and decentralization. I'll see you in the next video lecture.